Dawn of War was a success. Critics loved it, fans loved it, and RTS players found it an interesting change from most strategy games. Relic gained more fans, THQ made some money, and Games Workshop got some new customers. They really should have been reminded of that about a year ago, shouldn't they? But with the universe as vast as Warhammer 40,000, there was a lot more potential to add more unique playable races and appeal to their die-hard fans. And it was clear that the current roster of skirmish maps would end up being exhausted fairly quickly. Enter Dawn of War Winter Assault, announced and released in 2005. Winter Assault added a brand new playable race, as well as two short campaigns, new units for the existing races, and enough snow to make you wrap up fairly comfortably behind your computer desk. With promising new features, would Winter Assault deliver the same quality as Dawn of War, or be condemned to be subpar from its predecessor? Well, let's give it a look. On the fringe of human-controlled space, the abandoned planet of Lawn 5 was thought to house little more than clans of squabbling orcs and a small chaos war band devoted to the blood god Corn. Yeah, surprisingly following him doesn't offer a vegetarian option. Oh, never mind. As the planet's orcs are united by an ambitious war boss named Gorguts, an Imperial Guard regiment led by General Humanity Fuck yes Stern lands on Lawn 5 to reclaim a Titan. An enormous war machine left behind by the Imperium of Man. Krell, the planet's current ruler, learns of the Titan along with Gorguts and gives chase, while the Eldar lurk in the shadows to help the humans on their way, knowing an even greater threat is soon to arrive. It's a race for the Titan, with unlikely alliances formed and everyone at their throats once their prize draws closer, each hoping to bid for the Titan's power and- wait, bid? What the fuck? Yeah, no, it is bidding! Like, it's like Storage Wars, but with killing instead of money and actually likeable contestants. Speaking of which, Dawn of War's character-driven story might have made you say, this is actually a pretty good narrative. If this was adapted into a novel, it would be a prime example of how video games have narratives on par with- Oh. Despite no real development or backstory with these characters, many of them are still some of the most beloved in Warhammer 40,000 purely from their dialogue, unique designs, and the performances of their voice actors. Seriously, if you took a poll of favourite Orc war bosses, Gorguts would probably come second only to Gazgul. Nobody bigger than Gazgul, you ignorant kid. At least not yet. General Stern and Chaplain Varnus are pretty bloody cool. Why does everyone hired by Games Workshop want to kill them off in any opportunity? Gorguts is bloody hilarious. Kroll certainly plays the part of a bloodthirsty Chaos Lord with a strange fascination for Gorguts' eyes. And Tuldir... Well, to be honest, she doesn't really act very differently from Maka. Or Matcha. Fucking elves. The campaign itself is split into two five mission stories, one where you play as the Imperial Guard and Eldar, and the other where you play as the Orcs and Chaos. You switch between the two races over the course of both campaigns, with the final mission determined by which of the two reaches the Titan first. It's about as good and bad as the concept sounds. The first two missions tend to get their flow broken by the Eldar sequences, which really aren't made very fun at all by comparison of the Imperial Guard's really over-the-top invasions and holdouts. They also get really fucked over in Mission 4, with their objectives a lot trickier than the Imperial Guard's, no allied units to help them, and every other race after them, so it's almost like a metaphor for how the Eldar are in the universe. <laughs> the Disorder campaign is a lot more balanced in terms of enjoyment, nicely paced to let you enjoy Gorguts' shenanigans and Krull's... anger? But the timed objectives of Mission 4 both needs to be completed regardless of which race you want to win. It isn't too hard if you know the right exploit, <laughs> but nonetheless not very well designed. Let's be honest, Dawn of War 1's campaign could be made pretty easy at times when stuff like this happened. But Winter Assault has a much steeper difficulty curve, turning many scenarios into an engaging, action-packed, sometimes frantic battle for survival. Missions like Between the Stone and the Axe and the final mission were so satisfying that the moment I beat the game, I immediately wanted to go back and play them again. They're so tense and exciting, yet brutal and gritty. The harsh atmosphere of raw, unrelenting warfare that comes from the entire game is just... outstanding to me. Right off the bat, you're fighting fellow orcs for dominance, hunting for skulls to bear as trophies of power, seeking carnage and bloodshed wherever it offers itself, or throwing guardsmen against anti-infantry guns and overcoming superior odds with sheer weight of numbers. It's Warhammer 40,000 and I love it. 
Dawn of War 1 might have been able to tell a very somber and woeful story, exploring the more human side of 40k's universe and packing a unique atmosphere of its own. But Winter of Soul demonstrates the brutality of the universe better than any 40k game I can honestly think of. Yeah, I know Space Moon had all the gores and executions, but that was a different kind of brutal. And a video for another time. Unlike the existing races, the Imperial Guard aren't living war machines or elite ancient warriors. They're plain old human beings sent in the thousands and falling by the hundreds to win even a single skirmish. Every deployment of these guys is like the Ken Daflu- I keep calling it the Ken Daflu drop! It's not about Ken! These aren't the PDF guardsmen from Dawn of War 1's campaign, however. Oh no, they're motherfucking Cadian regiments going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Space Marines with their great adamantium bollocks. In game, the guard play a bit like the orcs. If they were squishier, could actually land a shot from a rifle and sucked in close combat. So, nothing like the orcs at all then? To make up for this, guardsmen can be beefed up with attached leaders to keep their morale in check, turning them into a firing line to be reckoned with. Your buildings can also act as bunkers, letting you make an incredibly solid defensive line. And as if General I can lift a space wing like a grit fueled Wolverine wasn't enough, his unit gets bodyguards to stay on par with enemy commanders. To top it all off, they also possess some of the best tanks in the entire game. This is the Baneblade. If those 11 guns don't sell it to you enough, I'll let them speak for themselves. We'll find anything standing in our way. Adding another human faction might not be the best example of showcasing more of 40k's universe, but the Imperial Guard's playstyle, unique units, and visual design makes them a welcome addition to Dawn of War. They're my personal favourite to play as, actually, and they're also a great army to play if you like your armies a little more down-to-earth than familiar tactical. Or at least as down-to-earth as wizards and chainsword priests go. GET THEM DOWN! The four existing races also gain new units, which complement their playstyles well. The Eldar get Fire Dragons, close range anti tank infantry, so this won't happen anymore. The Chaplain boosts Space Marine morale further and is another solid commander unit. Megrid Armored Knobs <laughs> are another tough as nails melee unit for the Orcs, but you can't attach the War Boss or Mech to them, so. Uh... And Chaos gets Corn Berserkers, more melee oriented heavy infantry because, well, let's be honest, the other ones weren't screaming enough about blood. Some balancing tweaks come from these new additions, largely involving squad sizes and their weapons, and while some removals are rather disappointing, others streamline particular units into their roles further, which in many cases I think is a good thing. Back then I never asked myself why I gave my melee infantry with poor accuracy a stationary weapon, because I never did. Instead I asked myself other questions like, Could Action Man beat Luke Skywalker in a fight? Yeah, yeah, go on, get him, Action Man, go on, yeah, do it, do it. I'm one of those people who finds an abundance of snowscapes or deserts pretty boring solely on their own, but in Winter Assault the action is so intense and the scenery so grand and imposing that I find my memories of the game being more than just constant shades of white and grey. The stark white of the snow is almost like a blank canvas to let the greens, reds and blacks of the different armies and their bloodshed stand out, making a strangely consistent colour palette. But that's just me talking about colours because I like colours. With Winter Assault focusing on the only war aspect of Warhammer, Lawn 5's bleak, frozen battlescape feels like a perfect setting. The huge, lumbering buildings like the Psychic Gate, the Talorn Fortress, and the Titan itself are a testament to the scale of Warhammer's universe, and the ramshackled camps of Orcs, along with the corrupted grounds of Chaos Shrines, show a planet once thriving with Imperial patriotism desecrated by their most hated adversaries. I'm going on a bit, I know, but what I'm saying is Relic manages to use a single biome without making it uninteresting, and harnesses its potential to emphasise the feel and atmosphere of the game, alongside an equally important part of presentation. Jeremy Sewell doesn't add more music to Dawn of War's expansions, but they did get an equally prevalent composer, Einan Zur, who has a surprisingly similar legacy. It exchanges some of the calmer tracks from Dawn of War 1 for consistently themed battle tracks, as well as adding the brilliantly composed Imperial Guard theme. The beating drums, brass, and deep chants sound very warlike and militaristic, with the Disorder campaign having intimidating, sometimes even tribal pieces to fit the nature of the Orcs and Chaos, and Order packing more heroic tracks to accompany the various advances and holdouts in the campaign. It adds so much more tension to the exciting set pieces, as well as harnessing that raw and brutal feeling to pump you up for all-out war against your unforgiving foes. On top of that, Winter Assault adds to Dawn of War's repertoire of brilliant and iconic voices even further. Almost the entirety of the Imperial Guard have such lovably hammy, yet remarkably awe-inspiring lines, and while I've expressed my bias towards the guards earlier in the review, they might just have the best range of performances out of every race. Victory is assured!
My scars prove my worth! Stop for no one! Along with the music, it's a superb example of how audio can add so much to not just the campaign scenarios, but the memorability of the skirmish mode. And it's not just the guard which managed this. We need a new driver! This one is dead! Use your pretty mouthy one, ain't ya? Witness your doom! I can appreciate a lot of people's preference for the first game over this. Winter Assault made some questionable balancing changes technically as well as mechanically. But when I hear those battle cries, the gunfire, explosions, and that intense music alongside the scene of your forces fighting for their lives, I feel more immersed than I ever was with Dawn of War 1. It just sucks me in. <laughs> no, not that kind of suck- Get out of here before I get my knobs on you! Such crude humour. Hold that rumbling! <laughs> oh, you lovable scamps. Personally, I think Winter Assault might be better than Dawn of War. It retains many of the original's qualities and improves on its weak points, polishing its cinematics, level design, and adding more objective and unit variety. It makes up for some of its more glaring problems with its new features, giving us more units to use, more maps to play on, and a shorter but tougher campaign with an entertaining narrative. Forgive me for being a bit of a number file, since I like using scores to measure how I felt about a series as it went along, but I would give Winter Assault an 8.5 out of 10. If the campaign didn't suffer from those design problems, this would have been a 9 for sure. It's still an engrossing, challenging, grimdark love letter to the 40k universe, and General Stern's words at the very end of the campaign still send shivers down my spine. Still, Relic would continue to take things even further with more expansions, so join me again next time for Dawn of War Dark Crusade.